behalf of Ishmael Reed Publishing Company, we thank you for joining us to celebrate the publication of New and Selected Yuri, writing from Peeling Till Now by Yuri Kugayama. Her collection of poetry and short stories published in 2011. And we do also want to thank Bob Holman, David Brolard, and the rest of the staff at the Bowery Poetry Club for making it possible to be here tonight with you. A couple of rules as we are already doing documentation, please no photographs or video without prior consent from the artists. And also please turn off cell phones and pagers and other devices that make noise. I will start off the program with poetry from my newest collection, New and Selected Poems, 1982 through 2011, that was released in March by World Parade Books. The yeah, first poem I'm going to write is one of my first poems. It is called The Tennessee Poem. My name is Tennessee, and all its people are inside of me. My lungs are Nashville, my heart is Chattanooga, my veins are its rivers, my kidneys are Memphis, and Lookout Mountain is my head. The next poem I'm going to read is a poem, if you guys are not familiar with the city of Berkeley, California, this is written, made, uh, uh, written about a street north of the university. It's called Roses for Rose Street. Leaving Berkeley Horticultural Nursery, we turned left on Rose Street, heading towards Shattuck Place, our destination Safeway in the Gourmet Ghetto neighborhood, where Rose and Shattuck Place where meet. Are you? I had never noticed roses on Rose Street until that day. Okay. Before, I had just paid yeah. attention to the Japanese red maple trees and California live oak trees all right, all right, lined up in front of homes with many different types of flowering bushes planted on the edges of lawns in front of living room windows between McGee Avenue and California Street. I was thinking about how Rose Street got its name as we passed by a house with an all yellow hybrid tea rose bush, signs of platonic or dying love, in front of a house between Grant Street and Edith Street. I thought about the song, Yellow Rose of Texas, that I learned about from a friend at work who was from the Dallas area and whose boss brought her a dozen yellow roses as a thank you gift. Then I saw a large shingled house between Josephine Street and Grant Street with, large, with a large light pink hybrid tea rose bush, a sign of sympathy and admiration. Now when we pass by, I check for the bald eagle painted under the roof on the Josephine Street side of the house and the painted squirrel on the Rose Street side and red and pink, green jalapeno peppers. The house is a Western stick style house the side of the art and crafts movement. In between Melia Street and Bonita Avenue, I saw many climbing roses in front of homes in a variety of different colors, red, pink, yellow, and white. At the Men's Faculty Club on the UC Berkeley campus, where we celebrated Mom's birthday, I asked a long time to build the street. The next poem I'm going to read is called The Big Apple, February 1st, 2009. The streets are empty, but the subway is crowded. Manhattan on a Sunday evening. Mom and I are heading back. Oh, excuse me. Yes, I thought yes. we, uh, yes. music for yours? Yes. That's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> right. The Big Apple, February 1st, 2009. The streets are empty, but the subway is crowded. Manhattan on a Sunday evening. Mom and I are headed back to the Infinia 50 Hotel on 3rd Avenue at East 50th Street. At 
after spending a day at the Whitney and the Guggenheim, we exit on Fifth Avenue. The sun is setting over Central Park. It looks like a jungle as twilight approaches and the, turf, the time lanterns slowly come on. The bare trees dominate the scene. We turn the corner onto East 88th Street. Mom and I are the only two on the street. It is quite dark. Lights are shining through the windows of Upper East Side homes as we head towards the 86th Street subway station. As the number six train approaches, I am listening to Alicia Key's song, You Don't Know My Name, from her album, The Diary of Alicia Keys, on my iPod and Nano. The train is louder than Bart and twice as windy. As we board the train, I hear a female automated voice saying, this is a Brooklyn Bridge bound six train. Next stop, 77th Street. A male voice says, stand clear of the closing doors, please. The subway is packed, The mom and I find a seat where our backs are to the window. We get off at 51st Street to walk to the hotel before catching the cab further downtown to watch the Super Bowl at the New Eureka Poets Cafe where we eat Chinese food and watch San Antonio Holmes make the winning touchdown for the Pittsburgh Steelers. The next poem I'm going to read is called Dream Team. It is the early morning of April 9th, 2009. I am dreaming about meeting Barack Obama. The scene takes place in a fictitious marble Washington DC building with columns and a dome like that of Greek and Roman architecture. There are 15 of us sitting around a rectangular table with a red tablecloth Red napkins are neatly folded in front of us. The women are wearing shirt sleeve black dresses with pearl earrings and necklaces. Their hair hangs to their shoulders. Michelle Obama is with them. I can't hear them. They are at the end of the table, probably listening to Michelle's story about her trip in Europe. Dad and Barack Obama are sitting across the table from one another. Dad is wearing black slacks and a blue pullover. President Obama is wearing a blue suit with a white shirt and a red tie. They are laughing about what I don't know. Their laughter creates an echo in the dome-filled room. I'm wearing a black shirt sleeve dress and silver flats. My hair is pulled into a bun and I'm wearing a pair of tiny rhinestone hoop earrings that has a matching necklace. President Obama disappears for a minute. All of a sudden, I hear him ask about my iPhone 3G. I'm listening to Halo by Beyonce from her album, I Am Sasha Fierce. As I show him the features of the phone, the dream ends. I wake up at 3.30 a.m. I'm not in the White House, I'm home. I fell asleep watching Judge Judy. Reruns of Roseanne are now on. A car makes a loud crashing sound as it comes over the speed bumps. Two blocks away, gunshots. The next poem I'm gonna read is called Jackson Soundtrack. I am five years old and in kindergarten. Michael Jackson's thriller has just come out. The song I remember most is Beat It. Alex Maynard, the son of the late Bob Maynard and the late Nancy Hicks Maynard, has just turned three. I remember him dancing around the house singing, beat it, just beat it. Five years later, I am now in fifth grade. The children's troupe of Roberts and Blank is warming up from our rehearsal of Joe. We dance to Man in the Mirror from Michael Jackson's album, Bad. My friend Nisi, who is sick of hearing the song, says, oh Lordy Jesus, which receives laughter from her friends. We have been dancing to Man in the Mirror for a few weeks now. Another five years later, I am now 15 and wrapping up my ninth grade year. We are in Germany, in Nuremberg's Allstadt, or Old Town. We walk towards a restaurant. All of a sudden, black or white, from Michael Jackson's album, Dangerous Blast, we all turn our attention. A crowd is gathered around an outdoor stage. 
a black model and a white model start dancing in black and white striped short sleeve sweaters, short white mid shorts, white crew socks, and black sneakers. We stop for a second to watch the show in this town where the Nuremberg trials took place. On that same trip, we are traveling home on a Swiss Air Boeing 747-400 that is traveling from Geneva to Los Angeles. Keep It in the Closet, also from Dangerous, is playing on one of the audio channels. It is two years later, June of 1994. I am now 17, and it is the summer before my senior year in high school. Dad and I are traveling on American Airlines number 14, a red-eye DC-10 jet traveling between Honolulu and Los Angeles. I am not able to sleep with a crying talker a few rows up and a movie blaring in my eyes. I listen to Human Nature, my favorite song by Michael Jackson from his album Thriller. Again, two years later, June of 1996, I am 19. We are now in Japan and traveling on the bullet train between Tokyo and Kyoto. We are at the beginning of our Japanese tour. I am listening to You Are Not Alone on a compilation CD I have, 1996 Grammy nominees. Fuji song flashes by. It is now four years later, August of 2000. I am 23. I have just returned home from studying abroad in England for two and a half months, and I am about to enter my senior year of college at the University of California at Berkeley. ABC, from Michael Jackson's album ABC, plays in the background of a commercial for Old Navy's graphic tees. I go to Old Navy and buy a couple of graphic tees. It is now July of 2002. I am 25. AmeriCorps is having its end of the year retreat at the Marin Headlands. The theme of the evening dance is 80s music. Billie Jean is one of the songs that is played. I put my Thriller CD in my suitcase three weeks later to bring down to the Atlantic Center for the Arts in New Smyrna Beach, Florida to listen to. Once I am down there, I do my exercises to it on the living room floor in the master artist's cottage made of pine wood. I also listen to it walking in between the cottage and my workshop on the wooden boardwalk that keeps us separated from the snakes, alligators, the armadillo, and the tortoise that makes the Atlantic Center their home. Even though he has died, his soundtrack, so significant in my life, continues. The next poem I'm going to read, I wrote when I was in eighth grade and we were studying human anatomy. Cardiovascular lesson. Once I thought that the heart was shaped like the heart we draw for Valentine's and the blood inside was red instead of blue. Then I asked if the heart inside was like the heart we draw for Valentine's and the answer was no. It looks more like a clenched fist. But when the blood inside hits the oxygen outside, it turns from blue to red. The next poem I'm going to read is called Disney Cinderella. She would wake up every morning to an evil stepmother and jealous stepsisters. She was treated like a slave, doing the cooking and cleaning. Her stepmother always complained about her food. Cinderella, the pasta is too sticky and a salad has ice burn, or Cinderella, the potatoes are a bit too hard. Then Cinderella was ordered to make their dinner again. One of the stepsisters accused her of stealing her dark blue bootcut jeans and white cotton blouse by guests. The other stepsister accused her of driving her Chevy Cavalier without asking her when she went to pick up ivory soap at Dwayne Reed. It turns out that her stepsister's ugly boyfriend had borrowed it. Her punishment was to go upstairs to her stepmother's room to hear a long list of new chores by changing her new baby stepsister's hampers, baby dry disposable diaper, cleaning the kitchen with Clorox wipes, and wiping down the bathroom with Windex and Pine Sol. Despite all of this, Cinderella was an upbeat young woman 
She did what she was told, and she was very pleasant. There were times when Cinderella would give up, like when her animal friends had made her dress for the prince's ball that was superior to Versace and Miyake, and it was ripped apart by her stepsisters. There were other times when she would lose her temper or her patience, like when her name was called every two seconds, Cinderella's Tuesday night, take out the garbage, or Cinderella, the hamper is full. She had her animals in her corner, like her mice, her dog, horses, and birds, as well as her fairy godmother. Because of the fairy godmother's story and enchantment, Cinderella was able to attend the ball, which was RSVP only. It was held at the Pierre Hotel at Peter Duchin's band for form. The prince had his eye on her, even though there were hundreds of others in the room, including her stepsisters who had crashed the gate. One was eating Krispy Kreme donuts even though she was diabetic. The other was eating a big bag of Cool Ranch Dorito chips. She licked the remainders off of her fingers. The Blue Book crowd was thinking, how grotesque. The prince was stunned by Cinderella's beauty and disappointed that she vanished, all except for her slippers. He arrived at her house in his shiny gold Lexus and slipped a glass shoe on her foot, which was more fancy than the latest shoe by Giuseppe Zanotti. They flew off in his private Learjet to honeymoon in Walt Disney World and Disney's private island in the Bahamas. The angry stepsisters and mother showed up at the gate, but it was too late. Their plane was taxing out to the runway. The last poem I'm going to read is one of the animal poems that was in my master's thesis. Circus Tiger. At the Universal Circus, six white tigers and two Bengal tigers sit on their haunches in an arc, surrounding the gorgeous Amira Diamond, the first black female animal trainer in the world, who is dressed in a gray and black tiger striped see-through tankini with matching leggings and long black boots. They stare at her, eyes glistening gold and aquamarine. They open their huge mouths, showing fierce white teeth as she flicks her whip in front of their noses. When she ignites the hoop into a circle of fire, a white tiger cooperates, flying through the flames, but a Bengal tiger hesitates and turns around and jumps back down. He narrows his eyes at the trainers if to say, hell no, I'm not jumping through that hoop. But I look like I got the word stupid written across my forehead. Miss mm -hmm. Diamond looks peeved. This is one of those times that she says in an interview that he pulled a fast one on her. And although she looks like she wants to whip his ass, she puts the flames out. Thank you. Mm -hmm.